Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, welcome back to Fighting on Film. Now, as we wait for Ridley Scott's much-anticipated Napoleon film, if you're listening at the time of recording, it's out imminently. Um, I think it's two days. I think it's November 22nd. It comes out over here in the UK. Me and Matt are going to watch it um, in a few days' time, and we'll be bringing you our review next week. So stay tuned for that one. Um, if you're listening post, uh, post-release, post then that's already out. Please go and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were thinking of of a film we could do in the interim. We had a week to spare. And, uh, and Matt uh, messaged me one evening. He was going, Robbie, I'm watching a quite an interesting flick. And I was like, oh, yeah, what are you watching, Matt? And Matt chose this week. It is 1976's Shout at the Devil. Yeah. Now, it sounds like a horror film when you listen, when you hear the name, don't you? A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Um, but it's actually... Sorry, it's actually an adventure film in many ways, an adventure war hybrid. Um, so I'll get into production and we'll learn a little bit more about Shout at the Devil. So the film is based upon Wilbur Smith's novel of the same name that was originally released in 1968, with the film rights to a lot of Smith's books being uh, bought at the time by British producer Michael Klinger. Now, he also bought the rights to um, Gold as well at the time. And Gold was another more fronted movie. We'll get to cast later. Um, that was released in 1974, and Klinger himself uh, produced 1971's Get Carter, among other projects. Ooh. Yeah, uh, and the film was directed by Peter R. Hunt, a British director, editor, and producer. His credits include, um, for editing, Killing Career, Sink the Bismarck, HMS Defiant, Doctor No, From Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, and The Ipcrest File, to name a few. Um, Holy hell! I know what a what a what a back catalogue there. Um, and then he directed uh, The Wild Geese 2, Gold, as uh, previously mentioned, and in 1969, Her Majesty, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. He directed the the best the best Bond film. Wow. <laughs> well, that's, oh, oh, that's gonna, that's no, I'm, gonna, I'm just throwing that out there. That's going to cause some controversy. I'm not going to die on that hill. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's a very that's a cracking career. What, wasn't a, it? what a back car. What a back catalogue there. Yeah, I know, right? Some absolute classics in there. Um, and the film was originally announced in 1969, um, but it took a hell of a long time to get funding. They originally wanted to use Cinerama, um, film in the Cinerama, um, uh, what's the word? Um, format. Format, yeah, sorry, film it in the Cinerama format. But that fell through as at the time, I think American studios were apprehensive on uh, sort of like projects that they weren't too sure that were going to be a hit and they, they wanted hits, and I think Cinerama had some maybe financial issues around the time as well, so it just fell through. Um, but the film was eventually put into production in the mid in the mid seventies, with Klinger himself calling it a combination of the African Queen and the Guns of Navarone. And I think that's a fair, I think that's a yeah. fair comparison. It's not bad. Yeah. It, it's essentially like it's like three movies in one. So much happens in this. Um, if mm. you haven't seen it. I mean, it's freely available to watch on YouTube as well, which is great this week. No idea it's, how, but it's yeah. on one of those channels that uploads full films with they tasty rips. The, I, and I, they must have the license to it because it's been up there for the an licenses. awfully long time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because um, this isn't, I mean, unless you're like a more aficionado or a Marvin aficionado, this one could just easily pass you by, I think. Well, this is what I was thinking about when you were doing the intro. Like, I we've we've done films with, with, um, with Moore and, and Marvin in mm. the past not together but we've done them and mm. whenever we've done cast we um we've always run down their various films and this one's always been one that i've i've picked out of their films yeah. and gone i've never seen that that sounds like a romp and it turns out it is <laughs> no it is and it really really is um so uh, cinematography was by michael reed who worked as a camera operator at hammer films early in his career before going uh, going on to become a, a DOP on larger projects, he worked. This is on where you tell me he worked on Steel Bayonet, isn't it? No, no, no. Oh. No, he didn't. Unfortunately, that would have been great. Carry he on. worked on 1959's Captured um, by John Krish, which is oh. the Korean War prisoner of war movie. 
um, that was made for the uh, British military intelligence. And it was famously, it wasn't banned, but it was it was um, restricted for a long time. And there was a BFI release on um, Blu-ray a few years ago. I've got it in the FOF HQ film collection, and we are going to plan on doing that one soon because that's a very interesting docudrama. Very interesting. Um, I think it's, it's up got, on the Imperial War Museum. Um, it is, yeah. It's on there now as well, too. isn't it? Mm. It's got Wilfred Bramble in it too from Steptown Sun. Yeah, I, w- I won't do the impression. I was thinking of doing it. Uh, <laughs> I've been kept. No, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> I will. Uh, and he would also go on to, uh, go on to be a DOP on 23 episodes of The Saint. Nice little more reference mm. there. Nice link. Um, and, and on Her Majesty's Secret Service too. Cool. So, so some real, uh, you know, friends calling upon friends in this one. Um, the mm. Mackenzie break and Von Richthofen and Brown. So there's some, mm. some good pedigree there. Um, it was filmed on location in Malta and very controversially apartheid South Africa at the time. Um, I know Moore was heavily criticised at the time because he'd done gold uh, the year, a couple of years before. Um, and then he would later go and shoot um, parts of the wild geese in South Africa too. So it was quite controversial at the time. Um, at, with a shooting period of 15 weeks in mid-1975, uh, the South African locations were shot in and around Port St. John. Um, and the parts of the film are based on the sinking of SMS Königsberg in 1915. Um, very, very loosely, I might add. There's almost nothing to do with the First World War in this movie. It's kind of just shoehorned in right near the end. <laughs> war, war just gets declared and it just happens to be... Yeah, they yeah. happen to read... Because they're in their own private little war, aren't they're they? They're having a private really? war, yeah. And they happen to read a memo about an hour and a half in and they learn that the war's been declared, which was I quite enjoyed that. So I was like, oh, yeah, they don't have they don't have telephones. <laughs> not not know where <laughs> they were. <laughs> the movie was produced by Tonav Films. This seems to be the only Tonav film produced. I think it was maybe a company-based uh, setup to shoot this movie. Um, and it's distributed in the UK by Hemdale Film Corporation and in the US by American International Pictures, who were owned by MGM at the time. Um, 13th of April, 76, released in the UK and 27th of November in the US. Uh, 50 minutes were cut from the original edit. Um, and I think you can tell near the end there's a, quite a lot of cutting um, that yeah. seems to just happen. Um, and a large sea battle between British and German warships was left out of the screenplay um, that's in the book due to budget restraints. And talking of budget, the film was shot for nine million and it was a big success in the UK, earning 15 million at the box office. However, overseas, it only grossed three million US dollars. But that's a pretty decent return. I think they probably broke even. Yeah. Um, and then after this, there's a bit of a souring between Klinger and Wilbur Smith. Um, they were meant to create more movies based on Smith books. However, it all ended in litigation, um, and I couldn't find any concrete um, information on that, but it did end a little bit sour between the author and the producer. Mm. So we, should, we could have got more Smith films, um, but we just didn't. Um, but the film was, again, controversial and derided upon release. Um, there was a lot of sort of feeling that the movie had a lot of old it just felt old to some people and then some people can get over yeah. the fact that it was shot dated. in south africa um there is an instance of blackface in this movie which incredibly dates it i must admit um i was kind of shocked to see it but yeah it's of its time and we'll just say that now the movie is very very of its time um but anyway our, re- our retro review this week comes from roger ebert uh november 11th 1976 and he says Shout at the Devil is a big, dumb, silly movie that's impossible to dislike. It's so cheerfully corny, so willing to involve its heroes in every possible predicament that after a while we relax. Um, This is the kind of movie they used to make back when audiences were supposed to have the mentality of a 12-year-old and it's great to be 12 again. The movie doesn't mess around. Marvin and Moore are well cast. Marvin plays the drunk with an exuberance he brought to the same role in Cat Baloo and Paint Your Wagon. Who else can roll his eyes so meaningfully over a bottle of gin? Moore is so proper, so reserved and detached that even in retreat, he seems to be strolling. Shout at the devil isn't great cinema, but it's great fun. I would agree with that. That's a that's a solid review. I, I It's interesting, isn't it? It It kind of harks back to those classic adventure films in a lot of ways but as we'll talk about later on it has this startling flip change in tone yeah about about two-thirds of the way through and um i I don't know about you but i think the film 
it works and i think the film's the better for it because it removes it from being a straight adventure movie in a lot yeah. of ways it mm, adds it, a more it, it adds a darker mistakes. tone yeah mm. it definitely gives you some stakes to cling on to near the end um when the movie kind of feels like it should be wrapping up it, it ramps itself up a bit and i can't mm. i did enjoy that mm. But what did you guys think? As always, we turn to you for the one word reviews. Um, You can find those on Twitter, now known as X, um, every Monday, Sunday before we record. Please get involved. Um, So we start with World War II TV's Paul Woodage. He says, underrated. Eddie Bond goes with Epic. Brian Williams goes with Fleischer. Ian McKellen says, Wunderbar. Martin W. Proto Bond. Tony Pollard, Königsberg. Joe Skinner says, Boozy. Uh, Military History Observer goes with Zanzibar, Pete the Paint, Revenge, and Nick Carrier-Vias goes with Boy's Own, Mark F goes with Good, Barry North goes with Mohammed, more about him in the uh, cast, and finally we'll end with Andy Cambridge who says fun. So I think the general consensus there is pretty on the level. I know some people said it, a couple of people said they didn't enjoy it, but I think this is one of the one of those kind of movies if you've seen it and you can accept it for what it is. I think I think you have a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. It is it's one of those Saturday afternoon films. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, it really is. Almost. But moving into cast, we've got Lee Marvin as Flynn Patrick O'Flynn and he's a kind of what a name. um <laughs> Yeah, he's a sort of philandering uh crook that is always on the lookout to make a fast book. Um, yeah. And the crux to the film at the beginning is that he ropes in Roger Moore's character um, to be the face of a of a um, ivory uh, expedition yeah. uh, into German territory. And he thinks that having a Brit along will um, protect him from the, the wrath of the, the, the Germans. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've had, we've had um, ample, uh, Lee Marvin on the show over the years. We have. Uh, he began his career in the fifties. Um, he was in Eight Iron Men in nineteen fifty-two. He was in the Glory Brigade in nineteen fifty-three. Um, became mutiny in fifty-four. Attack in fifty-six. Uh, he was in the Professionals, which we've covered on the show and love in nineteen sixty-six. Um, in nineteen sixty-seven, of course, he was in the Dirty Dozen. He was Sergeant Riker in sixty-eight. He was in Hell in the Pacific. Uh, um, and then in 1980 he was in the Big Red One, and then finally, um, he was in uh, a number of the uh, Dirty Dozen sequels, and of course in 1986 he was also in Delta Force with Chuck Norris. Famously, he was he was how topical um, as we go into December. More on that soon, l- folks. If you're listening, kind of linked, but not really. It's anyway. tenuous. It, it's <laughs> yeah, that's all you're getting before you see the artwork, guys. <laughs> on, the, on the socials, keep your eye out. December's coming hot and fast. Then we have uh, our second lead, which is Roger Moore, who plays Sebastian Oldsmith, who is a aristocratic uh, upper class Brit, who old Etonian uh, type. Yeah, yeah, is on his way to Australia to look after sheep because his family has bundled him away. He's just taking uh, a cushy job, isn't he? <laughs> well, it seems so, doesn't it? Yeah, or at least what's been sold to him is one. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was in Ivanhoe, The Alaskans, Maverick, and The Saint before becoming Bond in 1973. As Rob mentioned, he previously appeared in Gold. Um, He was in The Wild Geese in 1978. He was in Escape to Athena in 1979. North Sea Hijack in the same year. Sea Wolves a year later. And in 1997, of course, he was in Spice World. Then we've... (laughs) Hang on, I've got got a great thing about more that I found. So this is from Ian Holmes' book, Acting My Life from 2004. And I'll, there's another piece from it I want to say when Matt gets to Ian Holm. Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently they were flying to a location um, into the Kruger National Park in South Africa. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read from here Ian's uh, account. So he says, we hit bad weather and we had to fly through cloud for 40 minutes or so, during which time the small plane bucked and reared alarmingly. Most of us were quiet and pensive, contemplating the worst, though willing it not to happen. But more squirmed and whimpered for most of the journey. Eventually, he lay on his back and started to undo his trousers. Then his hand disappeared down the front of them. What the fuck are you doing, Roger? snarled Marvin, who was accustomed to Roger's clowning around. If I'm going to heaven, Moore replied. 
if the actor, I want to go with a smile on my face. That, that's <laughs> it's like it's it's like he's in the room. It's like it's in the room. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> But that's not that's not Roger Moore. That's Peter Sessions doing Roger Moore from Yeah, of course. From all the Street. best impressions are other people's <laughs> impressions of someone else. I know. Well, I just thought that was incredible. Just like uh, what, a what a story. A, wow. What a thing to happen. Wow, to I, have. You, I what a thing to did, have happened. Did, does Ian know whether um Roger managed to achieve his aviation climax? It, it just stops there. I assume okay. I assume they I assume them sort of judging him stopped them. I can't think Marvin would have allowed that to happen. No, but apparently they got on quite well. Um, they mm. had a shared love of Jack Daniels and uh, more had some shipped in from Johannesburg uh, to the Amazing. actual shooting location. And they, they I'm had making a couple a of little cottages. bit of money now, Marvin. I can get the Jack Daniels in on the bond he, money. He's got that bond money. Um, and they, they wild away <laughs> evenings together. Um, so they apparently got on really well. Mm. But speaking of um, Roger and his... Um, Urges. Uh, uh, we've got uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got Barbara Parkins as uh, Rosa O'Flynn, Rosa Oldsmith, uh, and uh, she is uh, Roger's love interest in the film, uh, who he marries and has a daughter with or a child with. I forget. Um, she was a Canadian American actress. Um, she began work in the early sixties, and she was in lots of film and TV roles, lots of um, guest appearances, and that sort of thing over the years. Then we have Ian Holm as Mohammed, who is O'Flynn's mute servant. Which and is great. The story, it is. The story goes that uh, Mohammed was saved by O'Flynn from Fleischer um, after he was hung from a tree uh, and left to die. Right. Is yeah, that why he's why obsessed he with hanging speak. people in the movie? Yes. I get reason. it now. He wants to hang the Ascaris and the Germans. Yeah, that part um, is hilarious. And possibly, and possibly some of the... Um, the, the, local the local tribes as well. <laughs> yeah. He has no issue with doing it's that. No it's chill, does he? Wild, isn't it? He, um, he just bring. He just brings like such a levity to that role. Like I, I, I love how he's the comic relief in certain parts. It's mm. just so good. Um, Always handing Leah Jin. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. He just knows what he needs. I've got another great little. Uh, if you, if you indulge me a moment, I've got another home, a home. Um, what's the word? Recollection. So, uh, f again, from Ian Holmes, acting my life. Um, so, Holm apparently took the role to escape his then-girlfriend, B, who admittedly he'd been having an affair with at the time. Um, and she phoned him on set and said, your little ivory tower has collapsed. I know about your affairs, and I'm having one too. So, upon learning this, um, Holm was really you know, quite cut up. He was crying on set, really upset. Um, oh, no, so I'm saw... having to reap what I've sown. I know, exactly. Terrible. Yeah. My, my chicken's coming home to roost. Um, so Marvin saw him crying um, and apparently said this, and I'll read verbatim. As I blubbed, Marvin gazed at me with the kind of blank, chilling hostility that was somehow softened by understanding and an in inexpressible desire to be kind. He stroked my hair and said this, Ian, let me tell you one thing. We all go through an awful lot of fucking in this life. Amazing. Holm was I, I, saying he was worried how Marvin would take it because he, he knew he was this like war hero turned like for a rugged actor, and he was like, "I, I didn't want him to see me upset." Oh, it's just great. Again, I would have loved to have had a drink with Lee Marvin. Who wouldn't? Yeah. Getting back to cast, uh, Holm was in The Bofors Gun in nineteen sixty eight. Oh, what a lovely war! Uh, the year after. He was in March, uh, March or Die, which we've done on the show in 1977. Yep. Uh, famously, he was in Alien in 1979. He was Napoleon in Time Bandits in 1981. Amazing. He was in, uh, inside the uh, Third Reich, the HBO, I think, or the TV miniseries in 1982. Lord of the Rings, of course. And in 2005, he was in Lord of War with Nick Cage. Yeah. A late, late actor. They died a couple of years ago. Shame to see him go. Yeah. One of the yeah. greats. Mm. And then we have uh, Hermann Fleischer, who is played by Rene uh, Kolderhoff, and uh, he plays the, the German commander of the province, uh, who is the main antagonist. Yeah. German actor, he actually began uh, acting uh, during uh, the, the, the war in Germany. He was in lots of thrillers and film noir. Uh, he was also in Stalingrad, Dogs, Do You Want to Live Forever in 1959. Wow. At uh, the Court Martial in the same year, The Atlantic Wall in 1970, Operation Daybreak in 1975, 
Soldier of Orange in 1977 and The Winds of War in 1983. That's quite that pretty yes. much rounds out cast. And yes, he does have quite a pretty interesting career in yeah. terms of he's war movies. He, he does. He he plays a role like an evil version of Baron Bombburst in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That's the only thing I could think of when I was watching it. It's yeah, like, heavy vibes of that. Yeah, he's the colonial villain mm. version of that of the Baron from Chitty Bang. Bang. Kept expecting an Ascari to walk behind him, going like, boom, tch, boom, tch, boom, tch, boom, tch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He was it's great though. He, he brings this sort of bumbling cartoonishness to the movie where yeah. he, I know you're not meant to take him seriously, but he's the big bad. It's mm-hmm. it's very good. And then again he flips too, and it goes a little bit yeah. dark, and we'll talk about that a in a moment. Dark. It does get a bit dark. But for now, mm. I think it's time for the alley time. It is. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. Ali Tally this week, it's a pre World War One that becomes a World War One movie, which is mm. rare. We've not done that. And we've not done many films that have c- colonial troops in. So that no. was nice to see. Yeah. Um, so, and they're armed with Martini Henry carbines. Uh, with Webleys in it, Vickers guns, cannons, biplanes. Um, but for me, my my favourite thing in the alley tally this week is uh, Lee Marvin in a pith helmet with a three or three bandolier around his waist. Mm. Um, when they when they sort of get to the more warrior parts, um, he just looks great. Like it's just it's Lee Marvin. Like he, he doesn't Lee look, on a look, Lee. look cool. Lee on a Lee, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure Matt will talk about it. But the the section where he's drilling the the, his, the colonial troops under his command. Um, it's just, it's just a classic Lee scene. It's, it's just so mm. good. Yeah, it's one of my faves. I might talk about that later on. Mm. Um, but there's all sorts in this. There's hunting double rifles. Um, the Germans um, have Gewehr 98s. It's um, nice. Yeah. As you mentioned, there's a few Martini Henry carbines in the background. SMLEs as well. Uh, there's a German lieutenant who has a Luger. Fleischer himself blasts after Lee with a um, Mauser C96. Brumandel. It's not yeah. a gun. It's a Brumandel Mauser. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rosa uh, has a, a Webley Mark uh, 6. Uh, yeah. Who, and she coldly dispatches a German prisoner with that. She um, really, really blows him away, doesn't she? She does. I, I yeah. think she puts all six in him. <laughs> I know. Um, the The... The Lee that Lee has is a charger loading Lee Enfield, um, one of the long boys, yeah. not the short magazine Lee he Enfield. Brings his, he has the stance that he uses in the professionals to fire his repeater with. Mm. Like he never, he uh, of course, as we know from talking to talking to Jim Dowdle a, f- a few months back, like we just, mm. Lee is the gun guy. Like he just yeah. is, you know, he's ex US Marine. Like it, it's that's Lee. Um, and he just it's it just never leaves him, does it? It's just it's just no, so great has, to see. Well, I'll talk about it now because he has that physicality of That's just it. he just looks right what behind a gun on screen. He just brings mm. this physical presence to the way he handles guns on screen. And the bit that um that Rob mentioned is, is he's training these fake Ascari uh, who it. he's gonna send Roger off with into the into the uh into the um, the tribal areas to to rustle up some funds by collecting fake taxes. Yes, and um, well, give, they give out the money, though, don't they? They do. They end up giving out the money. That's the That's funny it. part. Yeah, um, yeah. So they, the, the, the Lee gives him like a, a chest that he's supposed to fill with some walking around money, just to show that he's already collected some. Yeah, um, and he ends up that all the all the locals feign you know poverty and and they're starving and such and it, it just ends up with roger giving away the money to the to the locals yeah. which is great um but that scene where lee's training the the fake ascari um and one of them accidentally puts a round through his gin bottle um, yeah. great comic reaction from him and oh, then yeah he just... just runs that that charge loading lee enfield like a boss and he just cleans house of i don't think that's six an extra targets. I think that's that's either blank and the prop department, you know, making them explode. Well, that's Lee really shooting them. Like I couldn't work it out. 
Uh, I mean, he could do that, but I, it, was, it was probably blank just so they got it. I think it probably was, but it just looks Maybe. great, doesn't it? Knows. Like, you know, it ev- everyone, everyone with a rifle in this movie looks great. Even the, um, spoiler alert, but like it's from 1976, crikey. Um, at, at the end, when Moore takes out Fleischer with the Lee Enfield, mm-hmm. it's brutal. Like, it, yeah. Moore on it, Moore's never looked better, I think. No, I'm that's say very now, true. I think this, I think this is Moore's greatest non-Bond role, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think it's up there. Solid. You can make, right. can make a case for it. Even better than North Sea hijacking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that movie bored me to death because he was it barely is a film. in it. He was barely it is a film. in it. You know. Um, I like the scene where um, more blasts away at the Blucher as it's about to ram the. The ship That's he's cool. got like a Gewehr ninety eight and he's just yeah. shooting at the, this bar this it's just massive fun. impending the whole, ship. It's it a is. fun romp, isn't it? A um, um, couple of other things before we move on. The, there's a Vickers FB five pusher plane. Um, yes, there is. That's which really they nice. Find the Blucher with, and the the final scene with Lee. Um, the uh, well, it's also seen in um, the scene with the the pusher plane. It, it's used to shoot at the plane. But there's a, a Vickers gun playing the part of a Maxim, and it's a single arch smooth jacket Vickers with a fake conical flash hider added to the um, the, the blank adapter at the front. Of the nice gun. Vickers spotting there. Nice. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was just um, a regular old Vickers. Yeah. Regular and, and Maxim, Marvin yeah. on it again. M- Marvin just takes it on at the end and mm-hmm. holds off yeah. the the German <laughs> Kriegsmarine. Yeah. Like it's just yeah. oh, it's just so good. It's just brilliant. It really is. Like you know, and shout out the bit where. The bit where Lee has to uh, nearly fight that man in the in the costume, which I called a crocstume, because it was like a, <laughs> a crocodile or an alligator, and it just I couldn't work out whether it was stop motion or if it was a guy in a suit. But you know, like the old monster movies where they like they sort yeah. of really badly yeah. animate them and look like that, and it just it took me out of the scene. <laughs> but it was great, like, and I think mentioning all these little parts shows you how wild this movie is. It fits oh yeah everything it can in it's um, some of its parts as well isn't it yeah it is it, re- it really really is um i think a uh, final shout out for me is we've never had a river boat shoot out on the pod yet a, pad- a paddle steamer versus a <laughs> like a little river boat yeah yeah and that's true yeah we haven't um it's so fun like it's <laughs> it, there's only it's so hard to describe this movie <laughs> So they for the film they built they built a full size half replica of a German battleship. They built the um or they acquired the, the 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 plane and then they they um they brought in the steamboat as well. Yeah. And then they built a whole fort, the German fort. <laughs> it gets used like twice. Yeah. It two like very brief shots. And then there's a homestead set. Um there's there's a bit of scale to it, and I appreciate mm. that. I think it works no, really, it really well. Really, really is, yeah. And I like all the the rifles that Lee has in his office. Yeah, um, when he opens that Lee's door, and, that's great. Yeah, it's so nice. Yeah, it's it's just it. The alley tally might not be fantastic this week because there's nothing really I could really pin that I loved, but like it's so much going on. It's such a rich stew of things um, yeah. that it all really really works, and it's proper boys' own stuff, isn't it? Like it's just it great. Is. It really, really is. So I think, talking of that boy's ownness of it, maybe we should move into favourite scenes. Matt, your favourite scene? I think mine is Lee on the Maxim um, on, at the end of the film. He goes out like a don. Uh, he has he his he has his wild bunch moment, hosing down the German sailors as they're coming on. Um, and he holds them off until the uh, the ship explodes. But if you've never seen this film and you listen to how we, we've talked about this film, just the various little scenes, it must sound insane. We because... do a classic FOF review where we don't we don't hundred percent review something. We leave we we this is the thing we like to leave you hoping that you'll go away and watch the movie. We don't want to just go right scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. There's no point no. because you can see the movie. Yeah, um, we'll be here all day it, as well. Exactly, well, the, the episode will be longer than the film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that, well, that'd be quite something. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it's madcap. There's so much going on here. But yeah, I I like that. Um, and again, Lee just looks convincing behind that gun. Um, yeah, it's just 
it's Lee great. Marvin. Like I've said it before, yeah. like it, it's Lee Marvin. You know what you're getting. He and I think his his turn from like serious to to comic to bewildered to drunk like it's all so seamless like it's mm. it's everything you yeah. want in a marvin performance you've got it here it's it's just great i also really like the the battle on the hill where they attack the the the, the column that's moving up uh mm-hmm. parts to fix the blucher that was good um and it's like a long range rifle battle they open fire quite a, quite a, a range and cause chaos and the there's a German lieutenant that gets dragged down the hill face first. Yeah. Um, there's a bit where it's suggested that an Ascari is going to be decapitated by a sliding sheet of steel that falls off one of the the uh, the sleds that they're pulling. Uh, it's just big scale. And in in Moore's um autobiography, my my bond, my word is my bond. Um, he talks about the filming of that scene and he says they were all stood at the bottom of this hill in a gully. And as he was stood there and he he was watching them up at the top of that hill, which is quite a big hill. Mm. Um, and they were preparing these two big, um, essentially they're like big, um, big wheels, I guess you'd call yeah, they're them. Like pulling, pulling the, yeah. 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 They're, they're like, they're like, um, Large. They look like those wooden wheels that industrials like they spool up industrial. Wire yeah, like on. a spool. Yeah, like a cotton, like yeah. a cotton reel type. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah. So it that holds like parts, and they're, they're rolling them towards the blue. Car. Anyway, um, and he realised that they're all stood where this was destined to come rolling down the hill. Oh. So he, he he grabbed the radio and he told um the director like we're all stood here like should we move everyone that isn't needed? I um, think we should that, move. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. And um <laughs> no problem, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um they move all the people, and then Roger realizes that they've moved them even closer to where the thing is gonna be. <laughs> and he has to get on the radio again and get them all moved again. But his autobiography is really good. I would recommend it. There's a couple it, yeah. of bits I'll mention later on um that, that are really quite quite good. But I like that scene. It, it has a bit of scale. It's an interesting uh, concept of them being on a hill, dragging something, and uh, and, it, and it causing chaos. I just mm. nice little set piece. No, it really, it really is. Every every, every scene in this is, is well executed. That I don't think there there's a weak part to the movie. Well, I might talk about it later, but there's no necessarily weak set pieces. Um, mm. It all gets a, it all gets what it's going for. So my favorite scene this week. Um, it has got to be the fight between Flynn and Sebastian. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just so, it's so good. It's, it's funny. It's, it's slapstick. It's Keystone cops, it's, uh, but it's also quite brutal. Like it's everything you want in a sort of Western style cowboy fight scene. So the, the, inst- the instigating uh, issue is that uh, uh, Sebastian falls in love with Rosa and he asks for, Flynn's hand uh in marriage, like to give his the, the, the daughter's hand in marriage. But the, the the real problem is that Flynn has is going to swindle money from Sebastian after they've captured this box of German um funds. Um yeah. and and Lee starts with the hit the fighting by hitting him in in the in the in the in the private area, shall we say? Um and he says, and and Rose is like, how could you hit him there? And Marvin goes, Well, he's not the one pregnant, um, which is fantastic. Um, and it just turns into this proper, proper like bar fight, and you've got, you've got, uh, um, Marvin sort of uh, learns that that Sebastian was a Queensbury Rules boxer at Eton, and he's like footwork, my boy, footwork, and that comes up a few times. It's just some great dialogue in the scene, um, and it's it's just very funny. Like you get a, a bit where Marvin hits a a wooden post, and he, he's giving it the whole like my hands all broken and. And he's like, oh, you sure you want to stop? Like, you should stop now. Like, you go get while the going's good type thing. It's just Marvin and Moore sell that really, really well. And I, watching it a few times, I don't think there's many instances where there's stunt doubles. Like, they're doing that. And it's obviously... Well, in in um, in Moore's book, he, he talks about them rehearsing it for quite a while. Ah. Um, and then when they came to do it, Lee was apparently red-eye drunk. Like you can see was, it in, in the film, he, it's definitely yeah, four sheets. He was approaching like blackout drunk. Um, 
at least make nothing and less. When they came to do it, more essentially had to duck real punches. So he was in essentially a real fight with, with Lee Marvin. <laughs> Marvin's just um, going for it. Marvin just... Yeah, he was, apparently. Yeah. There's lots of anecdotes in in, uh, in Moore's book where he talks about he, Lee would be you know, sober one day and he'd chat to like, um, a member of the, the supporting cast and be, be like Pally and like old friends um, exchanging stories. And then, the, you know, he'd come on set and uh, at another point and he'd be pretty much done like sozzled and um gazebo he, he yeah he'd tell the guy <laughs> to like do one and like have a full-blown art like oh my god hateful argument with the dude how true that is i don't know but as i said most books pretty good actually yeah it's some great, good anecdotes there is some on great it. anecdotes in it um but it's just it, it, it's a scene for me that encapsulates how well Moore and Marvin were cast, and there's a chemistry there that you wouldn't expect. You wouldn't expect Roger Moore, like you know, this is this is th- what three years into his Bond work, um, yeah. coming off of the Saint, you know, being this really sort of a certain way of acting, a little bit Niven esque, where you're getting more of Moore than you maybe are of a character in certain movies, um, and you've got Marvin, and you, on paper you think Marvin and Moore like. Is this yeah, going to work? It doesn't work, yeah. And then the chemistry is just so well done. And I think the fight scene really shows you, like, there's these two actors who have, you know, Moore's obviously got fight training from Bond and probably the Saint. Marvin's coming from years of Westerns and, and these rugged roles. And it just brings mm. these two characters, essentially, they're not character actors, but you, you know what I mean by that. It brings these two powerhouses, like, in into their element. And it's just a so such a great fight scene if there's a if there's not there's not another scene in this movie that encapsulates how well this movie works it, it, it is that fight scene for me. It cemented like those characters it's, for me yeah it, it's physical it's funny it's very well done um yeah i also read uh roy mosley's biography of Moore, and in that he quotes uh peter hunt the director and he says they were very funny together and liked each other a great deal. They would socialize and get drunk together in the evenings. And although they never had thick heads in the morning, which mm, that, that might be a little bit, a little oh, bit of a white lighter, Pia. Um, <laughs> um, but Roger, Roger really enjoyed his time with him. Um, at one of the, uh, the the press premieres, he he said, "I love this gentleman. He brought out one of the you know best performances I've ever done." Um, I agree yeah exactly and it it shows it, it it really does it really really does so moving into final thoughts hello i'm al murray and you're listening to fighting on film the world's number one war film podcast this is a, a strange movie to like sum up but it's it's part as as i said guns and Navarone, part african queen but to me it's like drawing from uh, the man who would be king, uh, the wind and the lion, and then in there you've got these comedic elements that feel like they could be from ripping yarns from the eighties. I mean, I know yeah. our audience would know what that is. It's a uh, Terry Jones and and Michael Palin. Was it Michael Terry Jones and Palin? Mm-hmm. I think it was. Yeah, I think so. Um, which is this sort of boys' own adventure, sort of uh, like Kipling esque adventure type. Uh, TV yeah, like show that they did post Kipling and stuff. Yeah, wasn't it? like yeah. a post uh, post Python. Uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus original run, and it, it's it's got all that in there, and it just it just kind of works. Like there's there's so much in there for it's like a crowd pleasing movie, isn't it? There's something for everyone. There's mm. more and Marvin a great great cast. You've got these great set pieces. You've got uh, you've got a cracking fight scene. You've got some good shootouts. There's this whole sort of colonialism of it. The sort of the world's going to change. You know, you know the stakes. Or you know how the war's going to change everything. Yeah, it's got a lot in there, but then also, I mean, I know we're going to talk about it now, but then also it it gets to a point, and the stakes just are raised, and it becomes a revenge film, and you're not expecting it at all. No, you're like, not. of course, if that you read the book, changes you just, are. Oof. But about an hour and forty in, Fleischer and his um and his colonial army, uh, colonial army, um, they 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 mass because the war's been declared. And now they know they've got carte blanche to essentially do what they want um, with, with minimal repercussions. Um, and, the, and also they're going to go and help repair the Bluka. Um, But he sets about uh, Flynn's uh, homestead when F- Flynn's away. He doesn't know Flynn isn't there. He's out on a 
on an ivory ivory hunt. Um, and in the he's process, he's destroying of, the German fort when they destroying when the he German fort. Out. Yeah. yeah, so they're destroying his fort while he's destroying theirs. It's like a nice little parallel. But during that sequence, um, Rose's baby is killed. Yeah. Off off screen, I might add, it's done quite tastefully. But after that, it it becomes a revenge film. And, yeah, and then the last kind of in, insinuated that it's thrown into a burning building, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's it's, it's hard. You're it's, not it expecting hard. it. And it no. It hits. And it, mm. it it's quite a well shot sequence, as you say. I agree. And, it, mm. and from there on the film is a lot, lot darker. It is darker. It's, yeah. And she's you, consumed you... with you know, grief Anger. and the desire yeah. for revenge. And Moore has it in his own way, but he, he also sees a slightly bigger picture. Um, there's a, a, a bit just before he flies off to find the Blucher. Um, he says, you need, you, once this is over, you need to come back to me, essentially. That's it, um, yeah. And she's just not there yet, Roger. No, she's like, <laughs> like uh, she's, we need not, to, she's not ready you know, for that. Let, let's get revenge for this baby that we've, you know, it's just been taken from us. And then we can think yeah. about the future, eh? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I like that because she grounded that part of the movie there because it, mm. it still tries the comedic element, but it doesn't do it as much after that sequence. And I was pleased of that. Um, you still get quite a funny scene where, uh, where it's all the way through, essentially Flynn's setting up Sebastian to do the stuff he doesn't want to do. Um, so uh, Flynn sets up with the Royal, the Royal Navy for essentially Sebastian to go and put a bomb on the ship. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and they all like, and the Royal Navy work out they can bribe Flynn to do what they want with booze, which is hilarious. Um, just so There's great. some great bits in Zanzibar where the, he gets given like a very small glass of gin. Yeah. Plymouth gin. And he, and he, he looks gives at the, it. He gives the guy there. a look. It's great. <laughs> It's so great. I, I love the subtext of his alcoholism all the way through it. And we know that, you know, Lee liked to drink, but do you know the scene where Marvin holds the baby and yeah. Roger Moore looks physically concerned yes. about Lee doing this? So there's a, there's a funny anecdote about that in, uh, in Roger's book. Um, and he says, um, I remember being terrified in the scene when Grandpa O'Flynn was to pick up his young grandchild for the first time. As Lee, well known for his hard drinking, was six sheets to the wind and picked up the baby without supporting his head. Um, wow. Let, let me assure you, my look of concern wasn't purely acting. The boy has been crying like that. Sorry, let me go again. The boy had been crying like no tomorrow. But then suddenly, when Lee picked him up, he stopped. The reason? Lee breathed 200% proof. Uh, let me go. Lee breathed 200% vodka fumes all over him. I often wonder if there was a 30 something man in Port St. John who had grown up to be an alcoholic. That's incredible. Well, yeah. Marvin is the baby whisperer right there. You watch that scene though, and you can see there is a a genuine amount of concern when <laughs> Marvin picks up yeah. the baby. <laughs> it's great. Like Just get, the, the anecdotes are making that, this. Roger. Yeah, the the anecdotes are no problem, Matthew. The um the anecdotes are uh, uh, are making this episode for me. It's, it's so great when we get we get we get a biography where someone's really gone into detail about yeah, their experiences. Yeah. Because sometimes you read these autobiographies and it's like, and then I did this film, and then I did that film, and there's no yeah. in between. But I love I love that more Holm and Marvin had really wrote, wrote about this movie. You can tell how much they enjoyed it from that. You know, you don't hold on to bad memories; you hold on to good ones. Um. So that, you know, that comes through. Um, but then we come to sort of my issues with it. And they're not major, but I think talking about that tonal shift at the end, the movie feels like it's going to wrap up in a way. But then as a viewer, I was thinking, well, how can you wrap it up? Because so much has happened, but yet not a lot has happened at the same time. Yeah. And then this shoot, it doesn't shoehorn it, but this whole World War One started, now we need to go and blow up the ship. That element there for me, that's that's essentially the second half of the movie. And I felt what had been quite this rattling adventure tale was really well paced. I felt that ending dragged just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Um, that's interesting. That's minor. I, it's minor. I think for me, I I felt it was a little bit rushed because of the way that it had been cut. Rushed. I know might what be you mean word. about. I know what you mean about dragging. It doesn't have that pace. So no. compared to the first half of the film, it doesn't have that 
pace, which it you know ambles along nicely. The second part of the film kind of it's there's cuts that make it feel just not as well. Mm. And this is where that 50 minute being cut out, I think, maybe comes into play where they've had to to make an ending off of this much more elaborate ending. Um, And, you know, maybe having a sea battle in there might have helped to to explain why they need to go and blow the blooker up themselves. And there's some great model work in the film um, Mm. from Derek Meddings. We didn't mention him in production, but he worked on lots of Bond films, Aces High, Joe Knighty, Thunderbirds. Wow. UFO, Stingray. Um, and there's some great little can't say about saying that and there's lots of um nice little model shots in there when the blue cuts the the uh the dow in half Mm. and um a couple of other bits and bobs and and the the, it just might have added a little bit of something it doesn't have to be a big naval battle but it might have added something they kind of Um, get it in there at the start on the with the really nicely animated start with the, the credits, mm. they kind of get it in there, yeah. but they could have used stock footage, and I wouldn't have minded um, at all. Um, and I felt like the aerial sequence in the biplane dragged a little bit for me. Um, I, yeah. I felt like it yeah. sort of was. I was like, okay, I've, you've done what you need to do now. Like, okay. And then I was just sitting yeah. there thinking, Portugal, Portugal. I, I, Matt was like, I was like, oh, Portugal in the war. And Matt was like, <laughs> no, they weren't. Not till 1916. And then that ruined that whole bit for me, Matt. So I was oh, like, sorry, mate. They're I did breaking say, their neutrality. <laughs> when I said that, Rob, I did say, um, but we'll let them off. Uh, we, yeah, no, you did, you did, and we'll let them off as so, well because it's very nitpicky. But it's, but yeah. equally, whenever you get Portuguese representation in a war movie, you just don't. Yeah. So the fact they're in there is something. I mean, for me, it's it an enjoyable film, and it's you could sit down expecting one of these colonial Africa romps, and then it just changes into a revenge mm. picture. And I think that elevates it a little bit because a lot of the reviews I read, one of them is quite scathing. It described Lee as being like a, like a um, WC Fields character that's gone native. Um, okay. Just too slapstick. And I don't think so. Don't I don't see that. I don't I see think that. Lee, Lee plays it really well. I think Moore gives a great performance. I think Holm gives a great performance. And I, I, I think um, uh, Parkins does as well as, yeah. as Rosa. And I, my one critique of the film is the decision to have uh more take the take the um the killing of Fleischer at the end because okay. Rosa is about to and then more grabs you know the rifle offer and and there's a mad minute into Fleischer as he's trying to climb <laughs> it's out of the brutal, pool. isn't it? Yeah, he yeah. rattles him off, yeah. Um, and I, I, I thought that was Moore's arc of him redeeming himself for not being there at the time. I thought that was what it was. Yeah, that's probably mm. I it's just a minor thing that I, no, I, I get like, it. Well, you've deprived a, a grieving mother of the revenge that she yeah, had yeah, true, you know, wanted. True. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can look at it a, a couple but of different I, ways. But then I like the sort of classic cliche villain thing where you're like, there's no way he could have survived the explosion. And then he, you see a hand come out of the water and I'm like, ah, he's back. I love that cliche. I absolutely adore it. I love it. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was so great to see it. And yeah, like, I think, and I personally, as I said earlier, I think it's more one of Moore's best non-Bond roles. It's interesting to see that African aspect of the of the Great War, which mm-hmm. is, you know rarely uh, depicted on screen. Although I wouldn't show this to someone. And go, this is what the war in Africa was like. No, no, um, it's not. I would it's not do that near at a, re- a good representation of it. <laughs> it's again one of those instances where a film is set against the backdrop of war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's inspired by, isn't it? I knew, as as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the episode, I knew from reading the the synopsis whenever we'd done Roger Moore or Lee Marvin films, and I gone, oh yeah, they were in Shout the Devil. Um, I hadn't seen it, and I, you know, having read the synopsis, I thought that would actually be quite interesting to, get, to like, for us to cover. Mm. And now that we have, I. I Turns out I was right. Like it no, you were. really interesting yeah, film. It's very enjoyable. Like as I, as we said at the start of the show, it's on YouTube, it's out there to watch. Um, I think it's on DVD as well. Maybe maybe a Blu-ray knocking around here and there. Um yeah. but yeah, it's it's a fun one. Like stick it on on a Sunday afternoon after your roast or after your Sunday lunch. Like it's a perfect film for that, really. Um, I think personally, I think you can't go wrong with it. Um, and yeah, I think that was 1976's Shout at the Devil. 
Um, please join us next week when we go through uh, Ridley Scott's Napoleon. It's already having some controversy, shall controversy, shall we say, um, from Ridley Scott's interviews um, and such. Yeah. Press releases and interviews this week. Yeah, saying you weren't there. Do you know you you weren't there? How do you know that didn't happen? Um, which I think is interesting. Um, and we'll uh, we'll put that to the test <laughs> next week. Um, will it be a hit or will it be shit? We'll find out next week, folks. We will. When we review Napoleon. Um, so stick with us again uh, on Fighting on Film for your war movie reviews. Um, you can find the entire back catalogue of Fighting on Film uh, on fightingonfilm.com. Um, start from episode one, see how fast you can catch up. Um, also, if you'd like to, join the Patreon. We've got some interesting things coming up in December. That's the best place at the moment to keep abreast of that. Patreons, uh, keep an eye out. There'll be an announcement dropping very, very soon for our December output. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. Catch you next week. Bye-bye.